Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at the Portland Public Library and I'm here today to read a book to you. I'm going to read the first two chapters of Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reedy. This is the first book of the Enchanted Forest Chronicles and I'm reading this book with permission from Scholastic Books. So thank you to them for letting us read those, this book. We're going to start with chapter one of Dealing with Dragons, in which Cimmerine refuses to be, a pro refuses to be proper and has a conversation with a frog. Linderwall was a large kingdom just east of the Mountains of Morning where philosophers were highly respected and the number five was fashionable. The climate was unremarkable. The knights kept their armor brightly polished, mainly for show. It had been centuries since a dragon had come east. There were the usual periodic problems with royal children and uninvited fairy godmothers, but they were always the sort of thing that could be cleared up by finding the proper prince or princess to marry the unfortunate child a few years later. All in all, Linderwall was a very prosperous and pleasant place. Cimmerine hated it. Cimmerine was the youngest daughter of the King of Linderwall, and her parents found her rather trying. Their first six daughters were perfectly normal princesses with long golden hair and sweet dispositions, each more beautiful than the last. Cimmerine was lovely enough, but her hair was jet black and she wore it in braids instead of curled and pinned like her sisters. And she wouldn't stop growing. Her parents were quite sure that no prince would want to marry a girl who could look him in the eye instead of gazing up at him becomingly through her lashes. As for the girl's disposition, well, when people were being polite, they said that she was strong-minded. When they were angry or annoyed with her, they said that she was as stubborn as a pig. The king and queen did the best that they could. They hired the most superior tutors and governesses to teach Cimmerine all the things that a princess ought to know. Dancing, embroidery, drawing, and etiquette. There was a great deal of etiquette, from the proper way to curtsy before a visiting prince, to how loudly it was permissible to scream when being carried off by a giant. Linderwall still had the occasional problem with giants. Cimmerine found it all very dull, but she pressed her lips together and learned it anyway. When she couldn't stand it any longer, she would go down to the castle armory and bully the armsmaster into giving her a fencing lesson. As she got older, she found her regular lessons more and more boring. Consequently, the fencing lessons became more and more frequent. When she was 12, her father found out. Fencing is not proper behavior for a princess, he told her, in the gentle but firm tone recommended by the court philosopher. Cimmerine tilted her head to one side. Why not? It, well, it's simply not done. Cimmerine considered. Aren't I a princess? Uh, yes, of course you are, my dear, said her father with relief. He had been bracing himself for a storm of tears, which is the way his other daughters reacted to reprimands. Well, I fence, Cimmerine said with the air of one delivering an unshakable argument. So it is too done by a princess. That doesn't make it proper, dear, put in her mother gently. Why not? It simply doesn't, the queen said firmly, and that was the end of Cimmerine's fencing lessons. When she was 14, her father discovered that she was making the court magician teach her magic. How long has this been going on? He asked wearily when she arrived in response to his summons. Since you stopped my fencing lesson, Cimmerine said, I suppose you're going to tell me that this isn't proper behavior for a princess. Well, yes, I mean, it isn't proper. Nothing interesting seems to be proper, Cimmerine said. You might find things more interesting if you applied yourself a little more, my dear, Cimmerine's mother said. I doubt it, Cimmerine muttered. But she knew better to, than to argue with her mother when she used that tone of voice. And that was the end of the magic lessons. The same thing happened over the Latin lessons from the court philosopher, the cooking lessons from the castle chef, the economics lessons from the court treasurer, and the juggling lessons from the court minstrel. 
Simmering began to grow rather tired of the whole business. When she was 16, Simmering summoned her fairy godmother. Simmering, my dear, this sort of thing really isn't done, the fairy said, fanning away the scented blue smoke that accompanied her appearance. People keep telling me that, Simmering said. You should pay attention to them then, her godmother said irritably. I'm not used to being hauled away from my tea without warning. And you aren't supposed to call me unless it's a matter of utmost importance to your life and future happiness. It is of the utmost importance to my life and future happiness, Simmering said. Oh, very well. Well, you're a bit young to have fallen in love. Still, you always have that a precocious child. Tell me about him. Simmering sighed. It isn't a him. Enchanted, is he? The fairy said with a spark of interest. Oh, a frog, perhaps? That used to be quite popular. But it seems to have gone out of fashion lately. Nowadays, all the princes are talking birds or dogs or hedgehogs. No, no, I'm not in love with anyone. Then what exactly is your problem? The fairy said in exasperation. This, Simmering gestured at the castle around her, embroidery lessons and dancing and, and being a princess. My dear Simmering, the fairy said, shocked. It is your heritage. It's boring. Boring? The fairy did not appear to believe what she was hearing. Boring. I want to do things, not sit around and listen to the court minstrel make up songs about how brave daddy is and how lovely his wife and daughters are. Nonsense, my dear. This is just a stage you're going through. You'll outgrow it soon and you'll be glad that you didn't do anything rash. Simmerine looked at her godmother suspiciously. You've been talking to my parents, haven't you? Well, they do try to keep me up to date on what my godchildren are doing. I thought so, said Simmerine, and she bade her fairy godmother a polite goodbye. A few weeks later, Simmerine's parents took her to a tourney in Sethum by the mountains, the next kingdom over. Simmerine was quite sure that they were only taking her because her fairy godmother had told them that something had better been to be done about her, and soon but she kept her opinions to herself. Anything was better than the endless rounds of dancing and embroidery lessons at home. Simmerine realized her mistake almost as soon as they reached their destination. For the king of Satham by the mountains had a son. He was a golden-haired, blue-eyed, and exceedingly handsome prince, whose duties appeared to consist entirely of dancing attendance on Simmerine. Isn't he handsome? Simmerine's lady in waiting sighed. Yes, said Simmerine without enthusiasm. Unfortunately, he isn't anything else. Whatever do you mean? The lady in waiting said in astonishment. He has no sense of humor. He isn't intelligent. He can't talk about anything except tourneys. And half of what he says he gets wrong. I'm glad we're only staying three weeks. I don't think I could stand to be polite to him for much longer than that. But what about your engagement? The lady-in-waiting cried, horrified. What engagement? said Simmerine sharply. The lady-in-waiting tried to mutter something about a mistake, but Simmerine put her chin in her up in her best princess fashion and insisted on an explanation. Finally, the lady-in-waiting broke down. I... <laughs> I overheard their majesties discussing it yesterday, she sniffled into her handkerchief. The stipulations and covenants and contracts and settlements have all been drawn up, and they're going to sign them the day after tomorrow and announce it on th th Thursday. <laughs> I see, said Simmerine. Thank you for telling me. You may go. The lady-in-waiting left, and Simmerine went to see her parents. They were annoyed and a little embarrassed to find that Simmerine had discovered their plans, but they were still very firm about it. We are going to tell you tomorrow when we signed the papers, her father said. We knew you'd be pleased, dear, her mother said, nodding. He's such a good-looking boy. But I don't want to marry Prince Therondel, Simmerine said. Well, it's not exactly a brilliant match, Simmerine's father said, frowning. But I didn't think you would care how big his kingdom is. It's the prince I don't care for, Simmerine said. That's a great pity, dear, but it can't be helped. 
Zimran's mother had said placidly. I'm afraid it isn't likely that you'll get another offer. Then I won't get married at all. Both her parents looked slightly shocked. My dear Zimmerine, said her father, that is out of the question. You are a princess. It simply isn't done. I'm too young to get married. Your great aunt Rose was married at 16, her mother pointed out. One really can't count all those years that she spent to sleep under that dreadful fairy spell. I won't marry the prince of Sethum by the, the mountains, Zimmerine said desperately. It isn't proper. What? said both parents together. He hasn't rescued me from a giant or an ogre or freed me from a magic spell, Zimmerine said. Both of her parents looked uncomfortable. Well, no, said Zimmerine's father. It's a bit late to start arranging it, but we might be able to manage something. I don't think it's necessary, said Zimmerine's mother. She looked reprovingly at Zimmerine. You've never paid attention to what was or wasn't suitable before, dear. You can't start now. Proper or not, you will marry Prince Therentil three weeks from Thursday. But mother, I'll send the wardrobe mistress to your room to start fitting her bride clothes. Zimmerine's mother said firmly, and that was the end of the conversation. Zimmerine decided to try a more direct approach. She went to see Prince Therentil. He was in the castle armory looking at swords. Good morning, princess, he said when he finally noticed Zimmerine. Don't you think this is a lovely sword? Zimmerine picked it up. The balance is off. Hmm, I believe you're right, Therendel said after a moment's study. <sighs> Pity, now I have to find another. Uh, is there something I can do for you? Yes, said Zimmerine. You cannot marry me. What? Therendel said, confused. You don't really want to marry me, do you? Zimmerine uh, said coaxingly. Well, not exactly, Therendel replied. But I mean, in a way, uh, I mean, that that is. Uh, oh, good, Simmerine said, correctly interpreting this muddled reply as a no, not at all. Then you'll tell your father that you don't want to marry me. I couldn't do that, Therendel said, shocked. It wouldn't be right. Why not, Simmerine demanded crossly. Because, well, because princes just don't do that. Then how are you going to keep from marrying me? I guess I won't be able to, Therendel said after thinking hard for a moment. How do you like that sword over there? The one with the silver hilt? Sim Simmerine laughed in disgust and went out the castle to the garden. She was very discouraged. It looked as if she were going to marry the prince of Satan by the mountains, whether she wanted to or not. I'd rather be eaten by dragon, she muttered. That can be arranged, said a voice from beside her left slipper. Simmerine looked down and saw a small green frog looking up at her. I beg your pardon, did you speak? She asked. You don't see anyone else around here, do you? Said the frog. Oh, said Simmerine. She had never met a talking frog before. Are you an enchanted prince? She asked a little doubtfully. No, but I've met a couple of them, and after a while you pick up a few things, said the frog. Now, why is it that you want to be eaten by a dragon? My parents want me to marry Prince Therento, Simmerine explained. And you don't want to? Sensible of you, said the frog. I don't like Therento. He used to skip rocks across the top of my pond. Now he sank into my living room. I'm sorry, Simmerine said politely. Well, said the frog, what are you going to do about it? Marrying Therendo? I don't know. I've tried talking to my parents, but they won't listen, and neither will Therento. I didn't ask what you said about it, the frog snapped. I asked what you're going to do. Nine times out of ten, talking is a way of avoiding doing things. What kinds of things would you suggest, Zimmerine said, stung. You could challenge the prince to a duel, the frog suggested. He'd win, Zimmerine said. It's been four years since I've been allowed to do any fencing. You could turn him into a toad. I never got past invisibility in my magic lesson, Simmerine said. Transformations are ex advanced study. The frog looked at her disapprovingly. Can't you do anything? I can curtsy, Simmerine said disgustedly. 
I know seven different country dances, 17 different country dances, nine ways to agree with the ambassador from Cathay without actually promising him anything, and 143 embroidery stitches. And I can make Cherry's Jubilee. Cherry's Jubilee? asked the frog and snapped at a passing fly. The castle chef taught me before father made him stop, Samarine explained. The frog munched briefly and then swallowed and said, I suppose there's no help for it. You'll have to run away. Run away, Samarine said. I don't like that idea. Too many things could go wrong. You don't like the idea of marrying Prince Therindel either, the frog pointed out. Maybe I can get out of it some other way. The frog snorted, such as... Samarine didn't answer, and after a moment the frog said, I thought so. Do you want my advice or not? Yes, please, said Samarine. After all, she did not have to follow it. Go to the main road outside the city and follow it away from the mountains, said the frog. After a while, you'll come to a small pavilion made of gold, surrounded by trees made of silver with emerald leaves. Go stand Pat, go straight past it without stopping and don't answer if anyone calls out to you from the pavilion. Keep on until you reach a hollow. Walk straight up to the door and knock three times, then snap your fingers and go inside. You'll find some people there who can help you out of your difficulties if you're polite about ask, asking and they're in the right move. And that's all. The frog turned abruptly and dove into the pond. Thank you very much, Simmering called after it, thinking that the frog's advice sounded odd indeed. She rose and went back in the castle. She spent the rest of the day being flitted and fussed over by her ladies-in-waiting until she was quite ready to scream. By the end of the formal banquet, at which she had to sit next to Prince Therindel and listen to endless stories of his prowess in battle, Simmering was more than ready to take the frog's advice. Late that night, when most of the castle was asleep, Simmering bundled up five clean handkerchiefs and her best crown. She dug out the notes that she had taken during her magic lessons and carefully cast a spell of invisibility. It seemed to work, but she was still very watchful as she snuck out of the castle. After all, it had been a long time since she had practiced. By morning, Simmering was well out of the city and visible again, walking down the main road that led away from the mountains. It was hot and dusty, and be she began to wish that she had brought a bottle of water instead of the handkerchiefs. Just before noon, she spied a small grove of trees next to the road ahead of her. It looked like a cool, pleasant place to rest for a few minutes, and she hurried forward. Once she re reached the grove, however, she s the grove, sh however, she saw that the trees were made of the finest silver, and their shining green leaves were huge emeralds. In the center of the grove stood a charming pavilion made of gold and hung with gold curtains. Simmerine slowed down and looked longingly at the cool green shade beneath the trees. Just then, a woman's voice called out from the pavilion, My dear, you look so tired and thirsty. Come and sit with me and share my luncheon. The voice was so kind and coaxing that Simmerine took two steps towards the edge of the road before she, before she remembered the frog's advice. Oh no, she thought to herself, I'm not going to be caught this easily. She turned without saying anything and hurried down the road. A little further on, she came to a tiny, wretched-looking hovel made of cracked and weathered gray boards. The door hung slantways on a broken hinge, and the whole building looked as if it were going to topple over any moment. Simmerine stopped and stared doubtfully at it, but she had followed the frog's advice so far. So she shook the dust from her skirts and put on her crown, so as to make a good impression. She marched up to the door, knocked three times, and snapped her fingers, just as the frog had told her. Then she pushed the door open and went in. That was chapter one. I'm going to take a sip of water. And this is chapter two, in which Simmerine discovers the value of a classical education and has some unwelcome visitors. Inside, the hovel was dark and cool and damp. Simmerine found a pleasant relief after the hot, dusty road, but she wondered why no sunlight seemed to be coming through the cracks on the boards. She was still standing just inside the door, waiting for her eyes to adjust to the dark when someone said crossly, Is this the princess we've been waiting for? Why don't you ask her? said a deep and rumbly voice. I'm Princess Simmerine of Linderwall. 
Samarine answered politely, politely. I was told that you could help me. Help her, said the first voice. And Samarine heard a snort. I think we should just eat her and be done with it. Samarine began to feel very frightened. She wondered whether the voices belonged to ogres or trolls or whether she could slip out of the hovel before they had made up their mind about eating her. She felt behind her for the door and started in surprise when her fingers touched damp stone instead of dry wood. Then a third voice said, Not so fast, Warwick. Let's hear her story first. So Simmerine took a deep breath and began to explain about the fencing lessons and the magic lessons and the Latin and the juggling and all the other things that weren't considered proper behavior for a princess. And she told the voices that she had run away from Satham by the mountains to keep from having to marry Prince Therindel. So what do you expect us to do? One of the voices asked curiously. I don't know, Simmerine said, except of course that I would rather not be eaten. I can't see who you are in the dark, you know. That can be fixed, said the voice, and a moment later a small ball of light appeared in the air above Simmerine's head. Simmerine stepped backwards very quickly and ran into the wall. The voices belonged to dragons. Five of them lay on or sprawled over or curled around the various rocks and columns that filled the huge cave where Simmerine stood. Each of the males, there were three, had two short, stubby, sharp-looking horns on either side of their heads. The female dragons had three, one on each side and one in the center of her forehead. The last dragon was apparently still too young to have made up its mind which sex it wanted to be, as it didn't have any horns at all. Samarine felt very frightened. The smallest of the dragons was easily three times as tall as she was, and they gave an overwhelming impression of shining green scales and sharp silver teeth. They were much scarier in person than the pictures that she had remembered from her natural history books. She swallowed very hard, wondering whether she really would rather be eaten by a dragon than marry Therindel. Well, said the three-horned dragon from just in front of her, just what are you asking us to do for you? I... Simmerine stopped short as an idea occurred to her. Cautiously, she asked, dragons are, are very fond of princesses, aren't they? Very, the dragon said and smiled. The smile showed all her teeth, which Simmerine did not find reassuring. That is, I've heard of dragons who have had captive princesses to cook for them, and so on, said Simmerine, who had very little idea what captive princesses did all day. The dragon in front of Simmerine nodded. One of the others, a yellowish-green color, shifted restlessly and said, Oh, let's just eat her. It will save trouble. Before any of the other dragons could answer, there was a loud booming noise, and a sixth dragon slithered into the cave. His scales were more green, gray than green, and the dragons by the door made way for him respectfully. Kazoo, the newcomer said in a loud voice, Achoo! I'm sorry I'm late, but a terrible thing happened on the way here. Uh, uh, what was it? The dragon, to whom Simmerine had been talking, said. Ran into a wizard. Uh, I had to eat him. No help for it. Uh, 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 and now look at me. Every time the gray green dragon sneezed, he emitted a small ball of fire that scorched the wall of the cave. Calm down, Roxim, said Kazul. You are only making it worse. Achoo! Calm down when I'm having an allergy attack. Achoo! Oh, bother. Achoo! The, said the gray green dragon. Somebody give me a handkerchief. Achoo! Here, said Simmerine, holding up one of the ones that she had brought with her. Use this. She was beginning to feel very much less frightened, for the gray-green dragon reminded her of one of her great uncles, who was old and rather hard of hearing, and of whom she was rather fond. What, what's that? said Roxine. Uh, achoo! <laughs> oh, hurry up and give it here. Kazul took the handkerchief from Simmerine, using two claws very delicately, and passed it to Roxine. The gray-green dragon knocked his streaming eyes and blew his nose. That's better, I think. Achoo! Oh, drat. The ball of fire that accompanied the dragon's sneeze had reduced the handkerchief to a charred scrap. 
So Marine hastily dug out another one and handed it to Kazool, feeling very glad that she had brought several spares. Roxy went through two more handkerchiefs before his sneezing spasms finally stopped. Much better, he said. Now then, who's this that lent me the handkerchief someone's new princess, eh? We were just discussing that when you came in, Kazool said, turning back to Simmerine. You were saying about cooking and so on. Couldn't I do that for one of you for a while? Simmerine said. The dragon smiled again, and Simmerine swallowed hard. Oh. Possibly. Why would you want to do that? Because then I wouldn't have to go home and marry Therendil, Simmerine said. Being a dragon's princess is a perfectly respectful thing to do, so my parents couldn't complain. And it would be much more interesting than embroidery and, da and dancing lessons. Several of the dragons made snorting or choking noises. Simmerine jumped and then decided that they were probably laughing. This is ridiculous, said a large bright green dragon on Simmerine's left. Why? asked Kazool. A princess volunteering? <laughs> Out of the question. That's easy for you to say, one of the other dragons grumbled. You already have a princess. What about the rest of us? Yes, don't be snuffy, Warog, said another. Besides, what else can we do with her? Eat her, suggested the yellow-green dragon in a bored tone. No proper princess would come out looking for dragons, were object objected. Well, I'm not a proper princess then, Simmerine snapped. I make cherries jubilee, and I volunteer for dragons, and I conjugate Latin verbs, or at least I would if someone would let me. So there! Hear, hear, said the great green dragon. You see who would want an improper princess, Warug said. I would, said Kazool. You can't be serious, Kazool, Warug said irritably. Why? I like cherries jubilee, Kazool replied, still watching Simmerine, and I like the look of her. Besides, the Latin scrolls in my library need cataloging, and if I can't find someone who knows a little of the language, I will have to do it myself. Give her a trial run first, a Poirot's green dragon advised. Warug snorted. Latin and cherries jubilee. And for that, you take on a black-haired, snippy little... I would thank you to be polite when you're discussing my princess, Kazula said, and smiled fiercely. Nice little gal, Roxane said, nodding approvingly and waving Simmerine's next-to-last handkerchief. Got sense. Be good for you, Kazool. If that's settled, I'm going to go find a snack, said the yellowish-green dragon. Ora looked around, but the other dragon seemed to agree with Roxine. Oh, very well, Warog said grimply. It's your choice, after all, Kazool. It certainly is. Now, Princess, if you'll come this way, I'll get you settled in. Simmerine followed Kazool across the cave and down a tunnel. To her relief, the ball of light came with her. She had the uncomfortable feeling that if she had tried to walk behind Kazool in the dark, she would have stepped on her tail, which would not have been a good beginning. Kazool led Simmerine through a long maze of tunnels and finally stopped in another cave. Here we are, the dragon said. You can use the small room over on the right. I believe my last princess left most of the furnishings behind when she ran off with the knight. Thank you, said Simmerine. When do I start my duties? And what are they, please? You start right away, said Kazool. I want dinner at seven. In the meantime, you can begin sorting the treasure. The dragon nodded towards a dark opening on the left. I'm sure some of it needs repairing. There's at least one suit of armor with the leg off, and some of the cheaper magic stores are probably getting rusty. The rest of it really ought to be arranged sensibly. I can never find anything when I want it. What about the library you mentioned? Simmerine asked. We'll see how well you do on the treasure room first, Kazool said. The rest of your job I'll explain as we go. You don't object to learning a little magic, do you? Not at all, said Simmerine. Good, it'll make things easier. Go wash up and I'll let you into the treasure room so you can get started. Simmerine nodded and went to the room Kazool had told her to use. As she washed her face and hands, she felt happier than she had in a long time. She was not going to have to marry Therindel, and sorting a dra dragon's treasure sounded far more interesting than dancing or embroidery. She was even going to learn some magic. And her parents wouldn't worry about her once they found out where she was. For the first time in her life, Simmerine was glad that she was the princess. She dried her hands and turned to go back to the main cave, wondering best how to persuade Kazool to help her brush up on her Latin. She didn't want the dragon to be disappointed in her skill. Draco, Draconum, 
Dracone, she muttered, and her lips curved into a smile. She'd always been rather good at declining nouns. Still smiling, she started forward to begin her new duties. Simmerine settled in rather quickly. She got along well with Kazula and learned her way around the caves with a minimum of mishaps. Actually, the caves were more of an intricate web of tunnels, connected caverns of various shapes and sizes that belonged to individual dragons. It reminded Simmerine of an underground city with tunnels instead of streets. She had no idea how far the tunnels extended, though she rather suspected that some of them had been magicked so that when you walked down them, you went a lot farther than you thought you were going. Kazul's section of the caves were fairly, fairly large. In addition to the kitchen, which was a large cave, large cave near the exit so that there wouldn't be a problem with the smoke from the fire, she had a sleeping cavern, three enormous treasure rooms at the far end of an intricate maze of twisty little passages, two even more enormous storage rooms for less valuable items, a library, a large bear cave for eating and visiting other dragons, and the set of rooms assigned to Simmerine. All the caves smelled of dragon, a somewhat musty, smoky, cinnamony smell. Simmerine's first job was to air them all out. Simmerine's room consisted of three small connecting caves just off Kazul's living cavern. They were furnished very comfortably in a mixture of styles and periods and looked just like the guest rooms in most of the castles that Simmerine had visited, only without windows. They were much too small for a dragon to get inside. When asked, Kazul said that the dwarves had made them in return for a favor, and the dragon's tone prevented Simmerine from inquiring too closely into just what sort of favor it had been. By the end of the first week, Simmerine was sure enough of her position to give Kazul a list of things that she needed in the kitchen. The previous princess, of whom Simmerine was beginning to have a very poor opinion, had apparently made do with a large skillet with three dents and a wobbly handle, a wooden mixing bowl with a crack in it, a badly tarnished copper tettle, copper tea a badly tarnished copper tea kettle, and an assortment of mismatched plates, cups, and silverware, most of them chipped or bent. Kazul seemed pleased by the request, and the following day, Simmerine had everything she'd asked for, except for a few of the more exotic pans and dishes. This made the cooking considerably easier and gave Simmerine more time to start studying Latin and sorting treasure. The treasure was just as disorganized as Kazul had told her, and putting it in order was a major task. It was sometimes hard to tell whether a ring was enchanted, and Simmerine knew better than to put it on and see. It might be the sort of useful magic ring that turned you invisible, but it might also be the sort of ring that turned you into a frog. Simmerine did the best she could and kept a pile in the corner of things that she was not quite sure about. There was a great deal of treasure to be sorted. Most of it was stacked up to, in one of the innermost caves in a large, untidy heap of crowns, rings, jewels, swords, and coins. But Simmerine kept finding things in other places as well, some of them quite unlikely. There was a small helmet under her bed, along with a great deal of dust, a silver bracelet set with opals on the reading table in the library, and two daggers and a jeweled ink pot behind the kitchen stove. Simmerine collected them all, along with the other things that were simply lying around in the halls, and put them back in the storerooms where they belonged, thinking to herself that dragons were clearly not very tidy creatures. The first of the knights arrived at the end of the second week. Simmerine was busy cleaning swords. Kazul had been right about their condition. Not only were some of them rusty, but nearly all of them needed sharpening. She was polishing the last flakes of rush from an enormous broadsword when she heard someone calling from the mouth of the cave. Feeling somewhat irritated by the interruption, she rose and carrying the sword went to see who it was. As she came near the entrance, she was able to make out the words that whoever it was was shouting, Dragon, come out and fight! Fight for the Princess Simmerine of Lindenwall! No, honestly, Simmerine muttered in quick intercept. Here, you, she said as she came out in the sunlight. Then she had a duck as a spear flashed into the air over her head. Stop that, she cried. I'm Princess Simmerine. You are? asked a doubtful voice. Are you sure? I mean, Simmerine raised her head cautiously and squinted. It was still fairly early in the morning, and the sun was in the back of the person who was standing outside the cave, so it was difficult to see anything but the outline of his figure against the brightness. Of course I'm sure, Simmerine said. What did you expect? Letters of reference? Come around here where I can see who you are, please. 
The figure moved sideways, and Zimmerin saw that it was a knight in shiny new armor, except for the legs, where the armor was dusty from walking. Zimmerin wondered briefly why he hadn't written, but decided not to ask. The knight's visor was raised, and a few wisps of sandy hair showed above his handsome face. He was studying her with an expression of worried puzzlement. What can I do for you? Zimmerine said after a few moments had gone by and the knight still hadn't said anything. Well, um, if you are the princess Zimmerine, I've come to rescue you from the dragon, the knight said. Zimmerine set the point of the broadsword on the ground and leaned on it as if it were a walking cane. I thought that might be it, she said, but I'd rather not be rescued just the same. Thank you. Uh, not be rescued? The knight's puzzled look deepened. But princesses always... No, they don't, Zimmerine said firmly, recognizing the beginning of a firm, familiar argument. And even if I wanted to be rescued, you are going about it all wrong. What? The knight said, thoroughly taken aback. Shouting, come out and fight the way you did. No self-respecting dragon is going to answer a challenge like that. It sounds like a child's dare. Dragons are very conscientious of their dignity. At least all the ones I've met so far have been. Oh, said the knight, sounding crestfallen. What should I have said? Stand forth and do battle is the usual challenge, Simmerine said with authority, remembering her prince's lessons. She had always been more interested in what the knights and the dragons were supposed to say, instead of memorizing the places where she was supposed to scream. But the wording doesn't have to be exact, as long as it's suitably formal. You're new at this, aren't you? Rescuing you is going to be my first big quest, the knight said gloomily. You sure you don't want to be rescued? Quite sure, said Simmerine. I like living with Kazool. You like? The knight stared at her for a moment. Then his expression cleared and he said, Of course, the dragon has enchanted you. Should have thought of that before. Kazool has not enchanted me and I do not want to be rescued by anyone, Simmerine said, alarmed by this knight's sudden enthusiasm. This place suits me well. I like polishing swords and cooking cherries jubilee and reading Latin scrolls. If you don't believe me, ask anyone in Linderwall. They've been complaining about my unprincess-like behavior for years. I did hear something about fencing lessons, the knight said doubtfully, but knights aren't supposed to pay attention to that kind of thing. We're supposed to be about rumors and gossip. Fencing lessons were just the beginning, Simmerine assured him. So you see why I am perfectly happy to be a dragon's princess. Um, yes, said the dragon, but he did not look convinced. Speaking of dragons, where is yours? Kazool is not my dragon, Simmerine said sharply. I am her princess. You will never have any luck dealing with dragons if you do not get these things straight. She has gone to the enchanted forest on the other side of the mountain to borrow a crepe pan from a witch she knows. She what? said the knight. She's gone to borrow a crepe pan, Zimmerine repeated in a louder voice. Perhaps you'd better have your helmet checked when you get back. They're not supposed to interfere with your hearing, but sometimes... Oh, I heard you, the dragon, the knight said. But what does a dragon want with a crepe pan? She doesn't want it. I do. I found a recipe in the library that I want to try, and the kitchen just isn't equipped to handle anything but the most ordinary cooking. Kazool will fix that eventually, but for the time being, we have to borrow things like crepe pans and souffle dishes. You really do like it here, the knight said wonderingly. Simmerine refrained from replying that this is what she had been trying to tell him all along, and instead said, How did you know where I was? Things get around the knight said, waving a hand in a vague manner. In fact, I had to hurry to make sure I was the first. Half the kingdom of Linderwall and the princess hand in marriage is a rich reward, enough to tempt a lot of people who wouldn't normally bother with this sort of thing. Father's offered half the kingdom to whoever rescues me, Samarine said incredulously. That's more than all my sister's diaries put together. It is the usual thing in cases like this, the knight said mildly. It would be. Simmerine said in tones of deep disgust. Well, at least you can go back and tell them that I don't want to be rescued. Maybe that will keep anyone else from coming up there. I can't do that, said the knight. It's just not done, Simmerine finished. I understand perfectly. She gave him a polite farewell, more because she had been brought up well than because she felt like being polite, and sent him on his way. Then she went back into the cave and polished the broadsword until it was mirror bright, 
which relieved her feelings a little. There were two nights the following day, and four more the day after that. On the fourth day, there was only one, but he was exceptionally stubborn, and it took Simmerine nearly two hours to get rid of him. By the time, by then, she was so thoroughly disgusted and even considered letting Gazool handle the knights from then on, but she could not bring herself to do that. The knights would certainly attack Gazool as soon as they saw her, and since that was what they were go coming for, and sooner or later, someone would get hurt. Simmerine did not like to think that someone might get hurt trying to rescue her, particularly since she did not want to be rescued. So, with a sigh, she decided that she would continue to handle the knights as long as Kazool would let her. Prince Therindel showed up at the end of the third week. He was limping a little, as if his metal boots pinched his toes, and the feathers attached to the top of his helmet sagged badly. He stopped and carefully struck an impressive pose before issuing the usual challenge. Simmerine was not in the mood to be impressed. Besides, she could see that his helmet was a different style from his gold armor, and that the armor had gaps at the knees and elbows where it didn't quite fit right. Aren't you a little slow, she said irritably. There have been eight nights before you. Eight, the prince said, frowning. I thought by, there, by now there would have been at least twelve. Perhaps I better come back later. Simmerine stared at him in surprise. Why? Well, it would look better, Therindel explained seriously. There's not much glory in defeating a dragon that hasn't already beaten ten or fifteen people at least. Sir Gorlax of Mistwald wouldn't even consider going after a dragon whose score is less than forty-five. <laughs> I don't want to whisk, risk waiting that long, but eight, it just doesn't seem enough. You're going to go away and wait until Kazul has defeated fifteen knights before you come back to rescue me? Simmerine said. She found Therindel's smug confidence very annoying but she didn't like to say so straight out. Not if you'd rather be rescued now, of course, Therindel said hastily. Though you ought to consider the advantages, and I expect it won't be long. His voice trailed off, and he looked at her hopefully. I'm afraid it will be a rather long time, Simmerine said with satisfaction. You see, Kazul has not defeated any knights at all. But, but, but I thought you said there had been eight, Therindel spluttered. I said eight of them had come by. I didn't say that they'd fought anybody. I sent them away. You sent them away? Therindel repeated, plainly horrified. But that's, that's not done, I know, Simmerine said, smiling sweetly. But I have done it, and I intend to go on doing it. So you might as well go home and warn your friends. They'll feel so foolish, you know, if they came all this way into the mountains to rescue me, and then had to turn around and go back home without doing anything. They, they certainly would, Therindel said indignantly. What do you mean by playing these kinds of tricks? Don't you want to be rescued? No, said Simmerine, losing her patience at last. I don't. And I'm tired of having my work constantly interrupted. So please go away and don't come back. You can't possibly mean that, Therindel said. Besides, everyone expects me to rescue you. That is your problem, Simmerine told him. I'm going to go fix dinner. Good bye. And before he could say anything else, she turned and ducked back into the cave, hoping the prince wouldn't follow. And that's the end of chapter two. The next chapter is called In Which Simmerine Meets a Witch, Witch and Has Doubts About a Wizard. But we'll start that chapter tomorrow. Thank you for reading with me. Once again, this is Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reedy. It's a book published by Scholastic. And we're very happy that they've let us read this book to you. I'm Sarah Mari from Portland Public Library, and I'm really happy to have spent this time with you today. Tune in tomorrow for another few chapters, and I hope to see you soon. Bye!